Greetings fellow time travellers, wherever and whenever you are, it's lovely to have you, lovely to be part of the same big family, the same big community of like-minded types, so that we can travel through space and time together and contemplate the eternal verities. Uh, in this episode, we're in, the, we're in the modern era by now, uh, and we're thinking about the great, whoa, muscular, industrial push that powered British influence around the world. You know, it didn't come from nowhere. It came from somewhere. It came from our fathers, grandfathers, and our mothers and grandmothers. And it came from sweat and toil and a bit of brain power. So, to help support this podcast series uh, and to get access to all the uh, extras, you know, question and answer sessions and competitions and actually access to one another, you know, that, that opportunity to, to, you know, to swap ideas and share thoughts. Well, if you want to do that, it's easy. Just join my patreon.com site. Uh, go to patreon.com, search for me by name. You have to part with a little bit of cash, but it ain't much. You can do it monthly, you can do it annually. It's cheaper by the dozen. And I'd love to see you there. Okay, that's the end of the advert. It's time to strap into the time machine as we set off towards the next stop my love letter to the British Isles. Cue the music. It was a vibrant, beating heart of a place, and people loved it. In this episode, I'm taking you to one of my old stomping grounds, where nature and history combined. Dug deep and lined with shipbuilders, a mighty river was given an industrial facelift that powered a city. Glasgow made the Clyde, and the Clyde made Glasgow. Fitters, riveters and welders, and all the rest, Clyde built men, skilled, tough and hard-working above all else. Shipyards that built a fifth of all the ships in the world. Everything from luxury transatlantic flagships to the legendary battle cruisers that would soon face a determined enemy in the Great War. I'm stepping out across Britain to discover 100 remarkable places that have shaped you, me and the whole world I'm Neil Oliver, and this is my love letter to the British Isles. Hi Neil, in the last episode we travelled to one of the world's great natural harbours, a place you described as a graveyard beneath the sea cradled in calloused hands. Where are we this week? Paul, we're travelling this week from the sheltered waters of Scapa Flow in Orkney, which for centuries played an important role in maritime travel and trade and conflict, to a proud shipbuilding city whose yards built some of the greatest ships the world has ever seen and some of the legendary naval battle cruisers that were harboured in Scapa Flow during the First World War and during the Second. In this episode, we're on the River Clyde, outside Glasgow, in Clyde Bank, at John Brown's shipyard. Today, Paul, we're in a location that is actually connected to my own family history in a tiny way. We're at John Brown's shipyard in Clyde Bank, beside the River Clyde in Western Bartonshire. It's Glasgow as far as most people are concerned. Most people will have heard that the Clyde River was a major place of shipbuilding in the 19th and 20th centuries especially. Well, John Brown's arguably was the most famous, most iconic of all the shipyards. Uh, they produced great liners like the Lusitania and the Mauritania. They produced legendary battleships like HMS Hood and Repulse, but scores of others besides. They were, they were one of the big producers and the whole um, mythology, if you like, which is not to say that it's not true, uh, but the whole mythology of the Clyde-built man reverberates in a lot of people's minds with John Brown's shipyard. Mm -hmm. 
was a Clyde built man? It really refers to a, a type of individual quite tough. By tough, I mean strong and resilient. Skilled, because the, the ships coming out of the Clyde were regarded as the best. There was a time in world history when a fifth of the ships afloat had come out of the River Clyde. So they were massively well regarded. And the Clyde built men were no nonsense, great sense of humour, which is not the same as nonsense, <laughs> very professional, very good at their jobs, and they were as tough as the battleships they produced. Hard. Hard and strong, not to be not to be messed with unnecessarily by somebody that didn't want proper bother. Glasgow was one of your old stomping grounds, wasn't it? Do you remember these characters? Were they part of your time there? No, the, the great heyday of the shipbuilding was gone. I was at Glasgow University from 19... Where are we now? 1984 to 1988. And I, was, I lived in Glasgow with, with different jobs subsequently. But my family are connected to Glasgow. Actually, across the river from, say, Clyde Bank is Renfrew, more or less. And my dad's family hailed from Glasgow and my mum's family hailed from Renfrew on the other side of the river. But that shipbuilding tradition was on both sides of the river and it, it pulled in people from both sides of the river. And I, when I said that it, it's connected to my family history, it is because whenever one of the great ships was going to be launched, I mean, they, they took months and years to build these things and they grew, they grew up literally and became visible behind the houses. Huge objects in the landscape dominating everything around them. And when it came time to launch one of these things, it was a big deal. Depending on what it was, it could be anybody up to and including Her Majesty the Queen, or indeed the King, who would come and break the bottle of champagne over the bow of it. But they would always make an event of launching the, these great ships. And according to my own family legend, my mum and dad were both born in 1933. And in 1934, a ship called the Queen Mary was launched from John Brown's on the Clyde. It's one of the great liners, one of the great, you know, in the, in the days before air transport and people flitting back and forth across the Atlantic in the air, it was the heyday of the great liners and the Queen Mary was one of them. And so on the day that she was going to be launched, people gathered, huge crowds gathered on both sides of the Clyde. They gathered around Clyde Bank and they, ga they gathered on the other side of the river. And the thing about one of the features that made John Brown's shipyard possible and made it possible for her to build the kind of ships she did, the Clyde isn't especially wide. It's a major river in Scotland, but in the scheme of things, it's, it's not especially big. So when you're building ships, when you, when you launch them like straight out into the river, you're kind of curtailed by the width of the river. Because otherwise your ship's gonna, <laughs> it's gonna run onto the other bank. But at John Brown's, pretty much directly opposite the yard, was a tributary of the River Clyde called the Cart, C-A-R-T. And it meant that they could point the ships at the cart so that she would come off the slipway into the River Clyde and then push a bit into the cart. It gave them a bit more length and a bit more leeway. And so on the day in 1934, my mum and dad were both, well, a year old give or take, and my dad apparently was in a pram on the Glasgow side of the river, and unbeknownst to him, my mum was in a pram on the Renfrew side of the river, because both families were amongst the multitude that had come to watch the launch. And when she was launched, as they all were, they weren't painted yet. They would launch them, and then they would properly titivate them and finish them off. So she'd been sort of painted white, like a base coat, probably, like an undercoat almost. So it was this great big man-made iceberg, really, that was, that was coming off the slipway. And when she launched, and people in their excitement and their enthusiasm, especially on the Renfrew side of the river, standing beside the cart, they were too close to the water. And when the Mary went into the water, she pushed a great big wave like a big person getting into a bath. You know, she, she, there was a big wave went out in front of her. 
and it went ripping down the cart and it completely it flooded the banks and people were nobody was hurt but people were drenched and washed away <laughs> by the wave you know people were knocked off their feet by the wave and and that event was sort of fixed in both of my families you know the two families that came together to make me uh, it was in their folklore and when my mum and dad met in their they'd been in their early 20s when they met my mum and dad and they realised at some point that they had this event in common although of course as babies they'd been oblivious they'd just been in their pram the shipbuilding very much was synonymous with Glasgow Glasgow regarded itself as many things you know everyone knows that Glaswegians quite rightly uh, claim a great sort of cultural sense of humour people like Billy Connolly he was a product to the shipyards. Billy was a, a welder and worked on the shipyards for some time before life and talent took him in another direction. And the great ships, obviously, they required more than just an iron hull and an engine in them. They required everything else. So it pulled in all sorts of crafts, joinery, carpentry, the painters, obviously the riveters and the welders and the engineers and the mechanics that built the engines. So there were many, many skills were pulled in. And shipbuilding was part of the life's blood of Glasgow. And for that long period of time, that's what a lot of Glaswegians considered themselves to be. They were part of a city that built the great ships. And a lot of their menfolk regarded themselves and were regarded by others as Clyde Bill. It was a hard-working, tough-talking, great sense of humour, taking the piss out of one another, but skilled and able to get the job done. That, so it was part of Glasgow's confidence sense of identity, sense of itself. But interestingly, if you go back far enough, the Clyde would never naturally have been a river that was usable in that way. Naturally, the River Clyde was wide and shallow and quite slow moving. It was sort of coming across fairly flat ground by the time it got to Glasgow and was approaching the sea. So it was a wide meandering thing and a city had grown up and goods that were coming into Glasgow and coming into Scotland, the ships had to moor at Port Glasgow by the sea and all the goods, all the cargo would be unloaded into horse-drawn wagons and carts and brought the several miles up into Glasgow itself. But then in the 18th century, we've touched on it before, the tobacco lords came into play. Now, the Tobacco Lords, that was that group of families that made almost unimaginable fortunes, sort of Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk-type fortunes by the standards of the day, from trading tobacco. They were also involved in the slave trade. There was this triangle of trade where the ships, they loaded up, first of all, in Africa with slaves, sailed across the Atlantic, sold the slaves, now they had money and their ships were empty. And for the return journey, they were cleaned out and filled up with tobacco. And the tobacco came back to Glasgow and then it was moved on from there into Europe, whatever, around Britain. And great fortunes were made. And the tobacco lords, once they became established, they let it be known to the city fathers in Glasgow that it was no longer acceptable that the ships had to moor and unload so far away. They wanted the river improved. And various individuals, including John Smeaton, who was a, a lighthouse builder, and Thomas Telford, you know, names of engineers that people will have heard of, were consulted about how to go about the business of, what do you do? How do you turn a big, wide, shallow, meandering river into something that will let big ships right up into the heart of the city? And basically what was done... It was canalised. Artificial banks were built out into the river to narrow it. And by narrowing the water, it increased the speed of the flow. And the speed of the flow naturally dredged the river. All the sediment and silt and everything that was just lying, but because the river became more of a torrent, it pushed all the mud out to sea. And this process made the Clyde deeper and faster flowing. Okay, so you've, you've now got a channel in the middle of the river that's deep enough to bring big vessels into the city. And a saying grew up that I remember learning at school, Glasgow made the Clyde. <laughs> 
and the Clyde made Glasgow. So, your Glasgow became and was the second city of the empire, the British Empire, but it, it, it got that way by the trade that was made possible and the shipbuilding and industry that was made possible by the river. But first of all, Glasgow herself had to transform the Clyde into the river that she is to this day. Hence, Glasgow made the Clyde and the Clyde made Glasgow. And once that was achieved, then all sorts of entrepreneurial types saw the potential for the river. And, and it included the building of ships. And so, in terms of John Brown's, lots of ship, loads, scores of shipyards were on the river, but probably the, the, I mean, the most famous was John Brown's. It was actually established in 1871 by J and G Thompson, but it was taken over not long afterwards, really. But it, by, by 1897, a company of Sheffield steelmakers, John Brown and Company, had relocated up to Glasgow. So that's 1897, and from the end of the 19th century, right up into the middle of the 20th, the place rang to the sound of the fitters, and the welders, and the riveters. It's hard to describe now, for a population that haven't really seen it anymore. There were other cities as well. Belfast was famous for its shipbuilding, and there were shipbuilders on the Tyne as well. And it was such a presence, that industry, in a city, because it provided a livelihood for so many people, directly and indirectly. But the draftsmen, there's another whole art. You know, these things had to be designed by like, naval architects and naval engineers. And so the, the, the yards employed tens of thousands of people. My mum's family, my mum's brother-in-law, my uncle John, he worked for a company called Babcock's that many people will have heard of. Babcock's still exists. They built, amongst other things, boilers for the great ships at the time, and lots of other things besides. And a single company like Babcock's at one point was employing, I think it was about 30,000 men. Like, whole towns worth of people were employed. And there was a time in, in Glasgow especially, and further afield, where... You know, long before everybody just got sent to university like the way they do now, the schools sent their boys into the shipyards to get a trade. That's what happened to Billy Connolly. Billy Connolly used to joke that he really wanted to be, I think he wanted to be a draftsman, but he says he joined the wrong queue <laughs> and he ended up as a welder. <laughs> but that was what it was like. It's just lines and lines of boys coming out of the schools and depending on what skills they had and whatever, they got funneled into one or the other of the trades. And so it was so important it was like the army, boys especially, were guaranteed employment in the shipyards because they were hungry for people. My mum, never mind boys, my mum worked in one of the shipyards in the offices because there would be, you know, there were offices, secretaries and all the admin stuff was generally, the bulk of it was done by women. And my mum worked in one of the shipyards until she got married. And she remembered. My dad died uh, in November last year, but he, he likewise had all these memories of the ships. My mum still can talk about the atmosphere of the shipyards. From time to time they'd get sent, you know, she'd have to go down onto the dockside to take a message to someone. And, you know, she said the life of the, of the shipyard was completely intoxicating. You know, it was loud, with men shouting from the scaffolding on the sides of the ship, shouting down to her, and, she, you know, she'd be shouting back up at them, and the whole thing was... It was a, a vibrant, beating heart of a place, and people loved it. Heavy industries like shipbuilding are becoming rarer and rarer in the UK, aren't they? Yeah, we're post we're post industrial now. Is the is the expression? All these things went the steel yards. My father in law, uh, he he started out in the in the coal mines. He worked in coal mines down in Kent, and then he, he became an engineer. Worked his entire life as a, as an engineer, but his original time was served as a colliery mechanic. He learned the basics of his skills by fixing the machinery that kept the conveyor belts and the lifts and everything else running down the mines. So he went down the pits. His father, Jock, old Jock, as he describes him, worked his entire life in coal fields in Kent and in the central belt of Scotland. That industry's gone. Those communities, those pit villages, pit towns that lived and died by the pits, gone. 
Steelmaking. My father-in-law also did a bit of time working in for British Aluminium, another you know metal worker. All gone. It's all gone now. And there are still some shipyards on the Clyde, but not anything like the all-encompassing scale that it once had. Important to remember that it was that central belt. You know, north of it and south of it was different. I mean, up into the north, you were back into the highlands or back into more agricultural parts of the country. And south of it, down into the border country, likewise. Arable land, sheep, different ways of life. But right across that central belt, where the best access to the coal was, that access to the coal drove everything else. Because you needed the coal to have the furnaces and the the rest of the energy to make the steel, to make the coking coal that made the steel. And the central belt of Scotland was a band of industry, and it's all largely gone now. Britain is still coming to terms with being post-industrial. Because that whole sort of British Empire, Britannia rules the waves, it was all bound up with the fact that we were able to mine the coal to make the steel to build the ships to do all that. It was all connected, it was all interconnected. And along the way it provided good livings and good skills for, you know, over the generations, for millions of people. And it gave pride. These communities were proud of building the great ships. And the miners were proud of the fact that they were powering the empire, powering the country, putting heat into people's homes. All of that was part of that sense that Britain and the British had of themselves and what Britain was all about. It was hugely important. It's great having a snippet of your mum's personal history, bringing the atmosphere of the place alive. Yeah, yeah, she loved it. It's, I mean, it's it's funny. I mean, these are just childhood memories, but I'm sure my mum, to this day, somewhere in one of the kitchen cupboards, there's an electric frying pan, a big aluminium tray, and then a big black handle with a dial on it. And you plugged it in, and my mum used to use it all the time for cooking all sorts of things. And it was the wedding present that the office gave her when she got married. And of course, because she was getting married, she was also leaving forever you know she wasn't going to come back and it and it i'm, I'm pretty sure it still works <laughs> i'm sure it does i'm sure i'm sure my mum still uses it and that was you know this is 2022 and mom, you know my mum would have been given that sometime in the 1950s but yeah she talked any happily and my dad would talk about it as well my dad didn't didn't ever have anything to do with the shipyards directly but they were aware of it see the shapes of the ships rising when you look down towards the river and you know as I say any time there was a launch and you can imagine how often there was a launch goodness me I mean there were so many yards big yards apart from John Brown's and it would never be that long before there was another great ship coming out it was just fantastic stuff um you know to get back to John Brown's anyone that goes there now you'll see this in not well a big crane a great big crane, and it still dominates the skyline down there. It's been there since 1907. They called it Titan. And it was used for lifting boilers and engines up and into the ships. Once the great empty shell of the ship was there, and they had to get great big bits of kit, like engines to drive the propellers and boilers to power the engines, that was all lifted in and lowered by cranes, including the Titan. And so there she was, John Browns, and she built over the years RMS Lusitania, and she was the flagship of the Cunard Line, and who famously was sunk almost certainly by a German U boat, I think in 1917, but during the First World War. She had a sister ship, the Mauritania. And then, of course, the First World War broke out, and I mean, that fairly drove the industry, because a world that already wanted ships for the merchant marine for moving cargo about, suddenly all anybody wanted was battleships. So the First World War hugely invigorated the rivers like the Clyde. HMS Hood, legendary, legendary vessel, HMS Repulse. And then as I mentioned before, before the time of transatlantic flight, it was all about the big liners. So you had RMS Queen Mary, which was the one that my my mum and dad were babies for. RMS Queen Elizabeth, that would be QM1, 
She was built during the 1930s. And then by the time you get to the 1960s, the decline was already there because the world had changed and the shipyards on the Clyde were in decline. The last hurrah, the last big moment at John Brown's was the QE2, the Queen Elizabeth II. And she was built and launched in 1967, which was the year I was born. That was it. Once the QE2 was down the slipway and into the Clyde, the glory days of Clyde-built men and shipbuilding in Glasgow, they were over. There was a very, very famous, well, I say famous, it's, it's famous to those that know, there was a, a film made in, on the Clyde, it was called Seaward the Great Ships. It's a documentary feature and it won an Oscar. In the early days of Fly on the Wall documentary, it was part of inventing that look where the camera was just with the guys as they were eating their sandwiches and having a cup of tea and chatting to one another. And then on the up in the scaffolding watching the riveters, you know, seaward the great ships, you can tell from the, the tone of that title that it was about power and seaward the great ships. But even as that film was being made, everyone involved knew that the salad days were over. It was really a eulogy because by the time that film was in production, everyone knew Everyone knew that the, it was gone and it was never coming back because the problem for the, the River Clyde had almost been there from the beginning. It wasn't big enough. It wasn't wide enough. So the, the maximum size of vessel that could be built in the Clyde was set by the river and there was nothing you could do about that. And as the world came on, other parts of the world had facilities to build bigger ships. And the supply and demand and the laws of diminishing returns, bigger ships could be built in other locations for less money. Once anything gets bigger, the price of the product comes down. And having dominated the world across the, certainly the 1800s and the 1900s, Glasgow didn't dominate anymore and the big orders started going somewhere else and the Glasgow shipyards couldn't compete. If someone wanted a thousand foot long vessel, you can't build that on the Clyde. Or once it gets beyond a certain size, you just can't do it. So the QE2 launched in 1967 and in 1968, John Browns was merged with four other yards, Charles Connell and company, Fairfields, Alexander Stephen and Sons, and Yarrow Shipbuilders, those five together merged as the Upper Clyde Shipbuilders. Everyone was optimistic, you know, there was, there was hopes and it was done in good heart and good spirit, but it was a failure. Just because, for the aforementioned reasons, you know, global market forces were just working against it. And by 1971, it only launched in 68, and by 71, that consortium went into receivership. Glasgow couldn't believe it. And John Brown couldn't believe it. It was unthinkable that shipbuilding would stop. It, it was just there. Glasgow built ships. Clyde built men built ships. And the idea that the shipyards were over, it was inconceivable. And what happened in the Upper Clyde shipyards, there was a famous attempt by the workers to keep the thing going. I don't know how many people will have heard of them. If you grew up, if you're part of my generation and you have connections to Glasgow, you would know about Jimmy Reid. If ever there was a Clyde-built man, it was Jimmy Reid. And he, was, he led the union. And he said, what we're going to do, boys, is we're going to keep working. Even though they're telling us that it's all over. So it became, rather than a sit-in, it was a work-in. And they said, we're going to keep working. We're going to keep the job going. We're going to keep building. In defiance of the management that are saying it's all over. And it attracted a bit like the miners' strike, which was a different thing, obviously. This wasn't about stopping work. This was the opposite. But like the miners' strike, it attracted public sympathy, a lot of public attention. And money, there was a, a certain amount of money came in, in in the form of donations and whatever. And there was endless publicity. I mean, I can still remember seeing the likes of Jimmy Reid interviewed at the time. And there was some sympathy from... Uh, all sorts of different quarters, but the die was cast, really. You know, the writing was on the wall, as they say, and I think 
uh, even before the work-in started. And probably Jimmy Reid was a smart man and he probably knew the inevitable before he ever came up with the work-in. It was a last act of defiance, really. Well-intentioned, but it was never going to turn back the inevitable and it, and it didn't. Ultimately, like the rest, John Browns was sold to a company that refurbished oil rigs for the North Sea. They'd detach them from the wellhead from time to time and float them back up into places like the Clyde and they'd do them up, fix them, repair them and then take them back out to sea again. And, and so what had been John Browns became a, a place where that happened. But by 2001 it was gone. You know, John Browns closed for the last time. And if you go there now, it's a, it's a tourist attraction. You can go and see Titan. You can go and see the dock where the ships were built. It's like a grave, actually. It's a big, empty, boat-shaped hole. But it's kind of, it's heartbreaking. And if you get the opportunity to sail down the Clyde out to sea, you sail past rusting skeletons, like dead dinosaurs, like big metal dinosaurs. Some of those, uh, the big aircraft carriers, you know, those giants, the William and what, the Prince William, and the big modern aircraft carriers, they were in part built on the Clyde. So it's, it still happens. Ships still come off, but not in anything like the scale. Those days are gone, but, you know, you asked about, you know, Clyde built man, Clyde built men, it, and it wasn't just a legend in Scotland, it wasn't just a legend in Britain. I, I'm saying legend, it was real. That mythology had gone worldwide, and Gene Rodenberry, when he wrote the first series of Star Trek, he made the engineer Montgomery Scotty Scott. Okay, beam me up, Scotty. Because Gene Rodenberry in America, he knew, had heard somewhere and had taken on board the idea that because a fifth of the world's ships came out of the Clyde, if you'd ordered a ship from in Calcutta or if you'd ordered a ship in Hong Kong, the chances were pretty good that when it turned up, the ship would come with an engineer, It'd come with a, with a crew to deliver the ship, and down in the engine room, as often as not, there'd be an, a Scottish engineer. And Gene Rodenberry knew that, and so he was determined that the USS Enterprise would have in its engine room a Scottish engineer. Now, admittedly, the part was played by a Canadian, <laughs> James Doohan. He was a Canadian doing a Scottish accent. But that, that, that that's, gives you a sense. Gene Rodenberry writing about the future. You know, however many centuries into the future Star Trek was supposed to be happening, he was imagining that somehow or other Starship Enterprise <laughs> would have been built on the Clyde and would have a Scottish engineer in it. So the, the legend is still there. Glasgow became what it became because of industry. Well, first of all, because of the great wealth of the tobacco lords. You know, they built it. The great, beautiful buildings that Glasgow's famous for, they, they were made possible by the tobacco trade. And then after them came the big industry, like the ship building. And that's why Glasgow's 1.2 million people or something in a Scotland with a total population of maybe 5 million. That's what proportion of Scotland lives in one place. And in an unavoidable way, it no longer matters in the way that it did. Glasgow became big and had all those people there because they were doing something. They were building ships or they were, or they were involved in heavy industry. And Glasgow's kind of left behind by that. It's post-industrial. Obviously, a million people still live there and you know, there are still people working there. But Glasgow was what Glasgow was. It was made by industry, and the industry's gone. To some extent, Glasgow's like a, like a rock pool, maybe, that's been left behind by a tide that withdrew and left it. It's still big and it's still busy, but it isn't what it grew to be. You go to John Brown's now, and, and there it is, Titan. Still big, still impressive. It hangs over the old slipway, and it's where... I suppose if you sort of close your eyes and concentrate, you can pretend you can hear the ringing of the hammers on the rivets and the, you know, and the, and the, the endless talk of the men talking to one another, laughing with one another. But it's all gone. And sadly, 
It's what once was, but that will not come again. I guess many of the naval ships that were built here on the Clyde in the First World War would have spent time in the natural harbour of Scapa Flow we talked about in the last episode. Well, yeah, amongst other places, yes. Because Britannia ruled the waves. It was, it was uh, from the days of Nelson, well, before Nelson, uh, crystallised by Nelson, I suppose, and, and thereafter, br- the British Empire was all about controlling the sea. It was all about ships, and the epicentre of that, other people say different. I dare say the men of Belfast, you know, Harland and Wolfe, Titanic. There's a shipbuilding culture all across Britain. So it's right through. But Glasgow famously called itself the second city of the empire, and it probably was. And it's the beating heart of that second city was the Clyde. And the Clyde's heart beat fast because of the ships. birthplace and home to one of Britain's most famous leaders. Over a century before it was built as a royal thank you for victory and valour, after a decisive clash in the War of the Spanish Succession, one of the largest houses ever built in England, finished nearly 30 years after work began, an architectural tour de force that has divided opinion ever since. Its most celebrated son, Winston Churchill, was born here in 1874. The man who inspired a nation in its time of need. Next time, in my love letter to the British Isles. To help support this podcast, and to get access to new and exclusive history and comment videos every week, sign up to my Neil Oliver Patreon site. It'd be great to see you there. Check out the Instagram account called Neil Oliver Love Letter, And write a review of this week's podcast. Share it with your friends. For further reading about these favourite destinations of mine, you could try my book. It's called The Story of the British Isles in 100 Places, and it's published by Transworld. Neil Oliver's Love Letter to the British Isles is produced by Paul Ratcliffe and Neil Oliver for Fat Belly Films. Music is by Malcolm Goldie. Social media producer is Oscar CFR. Additional research is by Evie, Lucian, Archie and Teddy. Finance is by Catherine and Trudy. Post-production is by Althorpe Studios and the graphics are by Paul Plowman. And special thanks to the people across history who have made and continue to make these isles such an incredible place. This has been an FBF Podcasts production. <laughs>